Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. Um, thank you for joining us on this very sunny evening. Um, I'm Severa Davis. I'm director of the RSA Student Design Awards. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's special event, consisting of a keynote address, presentation of the tw 2015 RSA Student Design Awards, all followed by a drinks reception downstairs. Before we begin, could I please ask you to turn your mobile phones to silent? Um, but we are live streaming tonight's event as usual, so welcome to all of our web viewers out there, and please use the hashtag RSA Design if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. For those of you who may not know, the RSA Student Design Awards is a global curriculum and competition that asks students to apply their skills to today's most pressing social, environmental, and economic issues. It is the leading program for students looking for social design uh, applications. The scheme is driven by the wider RSA mission to enable and support people to build networks and create fulfilling lives and a flourishing society. And so tonight, we celebrate all the participants in the 2015 RSA Student Design Awards and the growing movement of design for social impact. Tonight, we'll see that purposeful design can be passionate, charming, witty, and something particularly important to me, fun. To appropriate a rather, to appropriate a rather well known quote, these students are designing the change they want to see in the world. So, we have many exciting things in store for tonight, most notably our keynote address by Paul Priestman and the presentation of this year's awards by Malcolm Garrett. But now I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the RSA Student Design Awards this past year. To deliver the RSA Student Design Awards schemes, we issue a set of briefs and then we work with colleges and universities to embed them in their curricula. These are the eight briefs that we ran this year and the ones that you'll be hearing the winning projects about tonight. They are not your average design briefs. They are on things like, how do we encourage creative thinking? How do we encourage healthy eating? How do we design a more sustainable society, particularly around toy products? To help students working on the projects, we have a university roadshow. We travel to colleges and universities to give briefings on design for social impact, and this past year alone, we visited 45 institutions around the world. We provide uh, support for students throughout the academic year through our workshop program. These are free workshops for students on themes such as commercial awareness and business acumen, design research, and how to design for behavior change. This workshop program complements existing formal design education and helps students to better understand how they can tackle the RSA briefs and more importantly, how they can continue to design with purpose. The program continues to grow in scope and I'm pleased to announce that this year we received entries from more countries around the world than ever before. We received entries from 30 countries with the majority coming from here in the UK, followed by the US, Ireland and Hong Kong. And for the first time ever this past year, we collaborated with the RSA's world-renowned public events program and asked students to produce an animation to accompany an audio clip from the RSA event series for the Moving Pictures Brief. All the finalists on this brief are available to view on the RSA's YouTube channel, but as a bit of a surprise, I'd like to show one of the four winners now to give you a flavor of what's online. So we picked a name out of a hat. Uh, of the four winning pro films to show you, and I'm pleased to say that we're just going to watch Dan Palmer's animation now. Curiosity is a muscle. Use it or lose it. It's something that we consciously have to, to nurture in ourselves, in our families, classrooms, at work. Sometimes I hear that curiosity and creativity are killed by too many facts, but actually the opposite is true. The more you know, the more you want to know. Not only that, but the more you know, the more connections you can make between the different bits of knowledge that you have in your head, and therefore the more ideas you will have. Which is why curiosity is really the wellspring of creativity. Technology is replacing routine work. And that's what, what technology replaces first, and it has done throughout history. So intellectually curious people, people who are capable of learning throughout their career, of asking questions, good questions, of adapting and collaborating with others from different disciplines, people who are capable of really thriving in this world of non-routine work, in other words, um, are the people that are going to, to do better. So congratulations to Dan and to everyone. Um, <laughs> um, 
it was, it was a tough decision just to show one, but that's all we had time for. Um, the rest will be screened um, in the Benjamin Franklin room downstairs in the drinks reception as well. And finally, as some of you may know, the RSA Student Design Award celebrated its 90th anniversary last year. To, and to commemorate the occasion, we published this report. Um, I think we published this report, yep, <laughs> charting the journey of the scheme and its role in, in uh, leading the world of design and design education. Hard copies of the report are floating around this evening, but you can also download it on the RSA website. So, I'd now like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Announcing our awards tonight, we have Malcolm Garrett. Malcolm is currently Creative Director of Images & Co., a communication design consultancy based in London. He has a global reputation for his influence on graphic design and popular culture, both through his landmark designs for Duran Duran, Buzzcocks, and Simple Minds in the 1980s. He's also known for his pioneering role in championing interaction design in the 90s. In 2000, he became the first royal designer for industry in new media and was elected master of the faculty in 2013, a position he still holds. He is noted for his collaborative and user-focused approach and his commitment to design education. Malcolm will announce the awards following our keynote address this evening by Paul Priestman. Paul Priestman is a designer, co-founding director of Priestman Good, and global creative director of CSR Sifong, one of the largest, world's largest rolling stock manufacturers. Today, he is known for his work in aviation, transport and product design, including the new Tube for London, as well as his visionary ideas to improve our everyday lives and encourage sustainable long-term thinking. He speaks widely on the subject of design and creativity and flies the flag for British design around the world. Paul chaired the judging panel for our Mobility City brief this year, which was also generously sponsored by Priestman Good. And I'm very delighted to announce that next year we'll be doing an exhibition of all the RSA Student Design Awards work at Priestman Good's gallery space in central London. But most notably for us here tonight, Paul is a two-time RSA Student Design Award winner. He'll speak tonight about his journey from design student to professional designer, and we'll have time for questions from the audience afterwards. Please join me in welcoming Paul to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, so, let's um, start. Um, thanks very much for coming, everybody, on such a beautiful evening. I thought you'd all be down at the river or wherever you are in the world, enjoying the sunshine. Um, I was going to start off by talking a little bit about um, how I got to um, where I, why I'm standing here now, um, and going right back to some of the, the early thoughts that I had, and um, run through some of our latest work that we're doing. Um, this is a picture of our, our, our office in, in uh, Great Portland Street in central London. Um, we have six floors of uh, designers here. And um, we specialize in different areas. Um, we do transportation, particularly, aviation design, design trains, and uh, we design ships. Big objects, I've always been interested in big objects. This goes way back to when I was at school. This is when I was about 12 years old. And um, I wasn't terribly good at school. I didn't really get many qualifications. But what I was able to do, I, I really got interested in ceramics, and I started making these models. And um, I found I could actually sell them. And uh, I started selling them to the teachers, and then um, I had commissions. <coughs> and I, I thought, this is, this is pretty good. Um, and it started to make a link between design and, and uh, making business and making money. And uh, I really started to get quite interested in this. I left um, in disgrace at school at a rather early age with very few qualifications. And um, about that time, my grandfather, who was an engineer, um, gave me a welding set. And, um, I started to make um, things out of old lawnmowers. Uh, my father, to keep me out of trouble, bought me some old lawnmowers, and I, I started making them into go-karts, uh, much to the uh, annoyance of the neighbors, and uh, highly dangerous, as you can see. But they went really fast, and I got really interested in the engineering. And I started to believe and begin to understand that design wasn't just about making things look pretty, but actually how they work. I then went on to uh, St. Martin's to do a foundation, and then went on to Central St. Martin's to do a BA in um, industrial design. And um, amazingly, I got in because I didn't have any of the required qualifications, but I got in on the strength of my portfolio, which I think is a really great lesson for everybody, and um, one that, you know, keeping portfolios is excellent. And whilst I was at the Central School, 
um, of uh, Art and Design and now Central St. Martins, I designed this, which was my entry for the RSA Student Design Awards. And it's an um, it's a, it's a airport in a suitcase. And the idea was that you could actually carry things around and then open it up, and then the play would extend out of the suitcase. And I made a model of it. This is all pre-computer, um, of course. Um, and um, I happily won a, a, this, this, this award. And um, I then, the following year, I, I, was, uh, I went to the Royal College of Art, where I was studying, and I entered again, and um, this time for a, a, a pill dispenser. And I came up with an idea of actually how you could indicate how, when you took your last pill and when you should take the next pill. And it won it again, which is fantastic. And from that, um, I won some <coughs> prize money, which um, allowed me to travel. And um, I was able to travel to China. And this goes back to um, the late 80s. Um, and the Royal College of Art managed to organize me to travel to China and to visit a number of colleges to do some lectures. I visited three colleges. And this is what I saw when I was there. At that time, obviously, you couldn't normally travel in China. And um, throughout my journey, there was a man that followed me, with me, and never spoke to me. He was just with me. Um, but it was the most amazing experience. Um, I was in towns where people had never seen a Westerner, and there were sort of hordes of kids following me, laughing. And uh, it was just such a joyous, joyous experience. And also the fact that um, everybody spoke to each other, and everyone's on bicycles. It was an absolutely amazing experience. Unfortunately, this is a photograph I took last week out of my hotel room um, near our office in China. And um, that's, that's um, actually pollution and traffic and not many bicycles. Um, and it, it, it's become something that I'm very, very interested in, is, is what are we going to do about cities and what are we going to do about changing um, people's uh, way of traveling and how people are going to actually survive in cities. Uh, you could look at Mexico City at 9 o'clock in the morning, you could look at New York at 9 o'clock in the morning or anywhere in the world, and you'll see this kind of scene. And um, cities are dying but more people are leaving and moving to cities. So what are we going to do about it? And I, I've always had ideas, and I've always tried to come up with ideas to try and solve those problems. And this is an idea I had, and um, one that, that has had quite a lot of interest. And it's called Moving Platforms. I'll show it to you now. So the, the idea is that um, you can travel seamlessly from outside this building uh, to another street in another city in another country without stopping. I, I always thought that um, the, the, the railway system is a bit pre-internet, it's not connected. Um, and it hasn't moved on very much. I and mean, we're designing high-speed trains for different countries around the world, and it's the same system. The, the, the first railway station was designed over 180 years ago in Manchester, and it's still in use today, exactly the same form. You still get wet waiting for a train. And um, here we've, we've got, you know, since then we've learned to fly, we've invented the motor car, and it's still, we're still doing the same thing. So I think we have to question that. And um, I come up with these ideas and, and push these ideas to try and get people to think differently. And the response to this has been absolutely amazing. So it's, it's trying, to, trying to get people to think in different ways. What's interesting, um, thinking about my original entry to the, uh, to, to the RSA bursary, is that a competition... Um, is very much what I do every day in, in business because instead of doing competitions, we're doing what's called tenders. 
So for these very large contracts of designing airplanes or ships, it goes to a tender, it goes to a company. And you have to, in effect, do a competition to win it. So it's, it's interesting that I'm still doing exactly what I did when I was entering competitions here. Um, so I think it's a very, very good learning curve. It's very, very good to, to try and express your ideas very succinctly and to explain what your thinking is to an audience when you're not there. And it's a very good skill to develop and it's very important in business. This is the new tube for London. Um, we designed this, uh, uh, well, nearly started on this two years ago. Um, and this, this new train will be running in, I think, 2021, so it's quite a way off. Um, we've just completed a high-speed train design in China, and that's going to be running in July of this year. Um, it's the different way that work, <laughs> different countries work. Um, you can probably turn the volume down, I'll carry on talking, but um, just up, up a bit more, perhaps. Maybe. <laughs> but, um, yeah, this, this is a, a great project because um, it's another thing that I'm very interested in in design, which is a sense of place because um, I want to know where I am in the world. If I'm staying in a hotel, I want to know where I am. And trains, interestingly, are an icon of countries, particularly high-speed trains. And the Tube for London, or the Tube, is a real icon. It's a brand of London. And what we try to do is generate something which is absolutely intrinsically London. But I hate retro. Um, I don't like looking back, because what are you looking back to? Who is you looking for? to? You know, my retro is completely differently to, to maybe many people in this audience. So what you have to do is move forward, but you collect things. Um, whether it's materials, whether it's um, smells, lighting, feel, it's that intangible thing which makes it London. And, um, you know, lots of people look at this and say, well, it's a London tube, uh, but it's a completely new vehicle. The other interesting thing about this project is that it's got fabric seats, and I always think that's very interesting because um, in not many cities can you have fabric seats. I mean, in New York, it would last five minutes. Or um, in Paris, it would have problems. So isn't that interesting that design actually allows people to treat things in different ways, even on mass, mass transit? And again, I think that's the power of design. And also the fact that the brief on this project was to make it 30% more efficient. And that's all to do with design. How you get people on and off the train more quickly. How can you create more space? And then thinking about the future, how they become uh, automated in the future um, and then how is that then integrated into the system so design is about things making things better it's not just about styling and it's total integration in this case with engineering and many other different types of technology color changing light edges of doors to encourage people to move seamlessly uh, so that you can get more trains on the system And this is a video that we put together just to explain the whole project. I also think it's very interesting with train design that when, when, the, when this was launched, it was on the front cover of a lot of the, the newspapers. It was the, the number one story on the BBC. Um, and it's, it's really interesting that, that objects like this have such an interest and appeal around the world. But also trying to get the detailing right. The other thing that, that, that is fascinating about transportation design and public transport design, which I'm very interested in, is the longevity of it. This thing will be running till 2050, and those armrests have to last that long. And uh, it's a completely opposite area to perhaps the disposable product design area that I was brought up in, where you have a mobile phone and you're waiting to get it replaced in six months. Uh, this thing is, you're talking about 10, 20 years. And it's a very, very different type of design. Uh, one that, that really has to make sure it has to work. There's no question about it. And it's a real challenging area to work in. <coughs> and detailing, of course. Um, I was recently made um, a Global Creative Director for CRRC Sifang, which is the largest uh, uh, locomotive manufacturer in the world. And when I went to China all those years ago, I would never have thought that I'd be designing trains in China. But here we are. This is with uh, one of the leaders, Mr. Gong. And um, this is behind one of the trains that we've been involved in the design of. They're the trains behind, that run between Beijing and Shanghai. And we're just designing the replacement to that one, which was first went into service five years ago. So they're changing them already. Um, one third of all high-speed trains in the world are in China. Um, and they've done that in an incredibly quick pace. And um, this particular factory produces, um, I think, a quarter of all high-speed trains in the world. 
Uh, it's an amazingly modern uh, factory. So this is the 380A, which is the one between Beijing, Shanghai, and this one here is the 500 uh, kilometer an hour test train, which is, is sort of pure symbolism. We design all of the exterior and all of the interior, but it's, um, it's got a character of, of, of China, and, um, and, it's, and the, the, the curve itself, the aerodynamics of it, um, really, has, it, it, it is part of the, the design, but really the style of it, the character, they call it the head, the face, is very, very important. And it's to the point where these trains appear on milk bottles and stamps, and uh, it's, it's really interesting how it becomes part of modernity, a part of a modern country. And uh, it's a very interesting, again, a very interesting area of design. A large part of um, the work at Prisma Good is in the aviation sector. And um, we've been working in, in aviation for many years. And this is almost the history of it. And in the far distance, that's the A380, which is the super jumbo double deck. And that goes back about 15 years ago when we were asked to design the interior of that aircraft by Airbus. Um, and we designed and built it here in the UK and then shipped it down to Toulouse. And then uh, more recently, the A350, which is the one in between, which is being launched currently. We designed the original interior for Airbus for that. And then more recently, again, the A330, which we're working on at the moment. Uh, these are massive projects. They involve thousands of people. And uh, I've, again, I've, I've always been interested in trying to develop a business which in, it allows it to design things like this. I didn't want to be designing little trinkets or little things for rich people's tables, things that really make a difference. And to, to do that, you do need a bigger company. And that's why we, I started to build up Priest Magood as we did. Um, this is um, Embraer, a Brazilian aircraft manufacturer. And, and this is the E2. And this is an aircraft interior that we've just designed. It was launched last year. And... Um, it's a complete, they call it a tube, so you're given a sort of an aluminium tube and, and, and say fill it. Um, so in, this is the entrance area. But what we're trying to do is, is actually create something that has a commonality to it. Because there's a big battle going on between the brands. Is it the aviation, is it the airline brand or is it the aircraft manufacturer brand? So number one, we're trying to save weight, uh, trying to save fuel, but also think about longevity and how things last. This is a, a first class. And then just as an example, one, one thing that, that struck me when we started on this project is that when you enter an aircraft, the bins are normally open. It looks a complete mess. Uh, so what we tried to do is make sure that it looked really beautiful when the bins are open. So that as the bins swing up, the bin doors, those are the bits you put your luggage in, um, they, they actually integrate into the ceiling and create a really lovely curve. And then when it shuts, uh, when the doors shut, it reveals a lighting detail down the center of the aircraft. So it's completely integrated, but also gives the feeling of of spaciousness, and it's also a, a weight saving because you can reduce componentry. So again, it's three things that come together to try and make the design correct and uh, trying to sell it to the various companies. And then also solving problems. Obviously, that, that's, that's the other big thing of, of design. And um, this, this area here is in the research that we carried out that a lot of people complain about people leaning over to touch the button in their armpit, getting close to their, their face or whatever. Um, so we tried to solve that by actually giving ind independent in, uh, individual little, they call them gaspers, the air bits, and, and the light switches and call buttons, and, and trying to make it feel very, very uh, simple and understandable. The other thing that, that I'm very interested in is demographics and aging population, um, thinking about what, what's happening. Uh, I know it's not very popular when you're young, but uh, you have to think about it. Um, and... Uh, Interestingly, I have a friend who's unfortunately um, you know, heavily disabled, and, and he um, said, what are you going to do about aircraft? So I asked him along to the studio. I didn't tell any of the designers what, he was going to, what the talk was about, and he berated them for about an hour about the awful experiences that he has. And we started to do a project, and the, and the project is called Air Access, and it's trying to solve the problem. It's really interesting. On aircraft, there is actually no legislation, unlike on a train or on a bus, for actual places for people in wheelchairs or wheelchairs users to use. So the idea that, that um, I had was that why can't all the seats actually be actually accessible? And um, by having a detachable area of the seat which can come out, you can go into the jetway into the airport, someone can get into the seat at leisure and then board with everybody else. The thing about aircraft design is that, that um, there's something called the 15G crash test, which is a very, very 
sudden deceleration. And you can't just put a wheelchair in an aeroplane because it would fall to bits. And if you did design a wheelchair to fit in an aeroplane, it would cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. So um, the idea here is the lightweight structure clips into the seat which can survive this test. Um, and then it clips in and then the seat belt goes around the person to take the strain on impact. So, and um, when, when this was launched, and that goes forward, um, there was an amazing interest, particularly from governments around the world, um, the US Senate and the UK government. And um, I think things are changing and we're trying to get this into production. And again, this is something that I've always tried to do, is, is, is come up with ideas and see if you can make things change. The, the airlines aren't going to do it, and the aircraft manufacturers aren't going to do it, because there's no money at this point in, 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 the, in the equation. So by sort of trying to do these projects and push them, it can sometimes jerk things into, into action. And that's what we try to do with these projects. We just send them out into the, uh, into the, into the internet and see what happens, and uh, see what happen comes back. So going back, this is again probably that same street in China, and uh, it, was always, it was always a sobering thought as I'm sitting in these in these pollution uh, traffic jams. I do like the quote that, that sort of, you're not in traffic, you are traffic, and uh, I think that's uh, you know, that's what we're going to try and do. And and some of the projects we're doing, looking at monorails and and, and projects which are actually involved in transportation above the traffic or below the traffic, I find really interesting, although it takes time. So I was going to finish off now um, just with a, a, another project, and um, e exciting project. We were contacted by some people from NASA, and uh, they said, uh, would you be interested in designing a, a spaceship? And we thought, well, yes, probably. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, um, and we came up with this. It's quite a complicated series of, of, of procedures. So we put together this movie, apart from designing, obviously, the, the capsule. Um, and we, we put together a movie just to sh try and explain the complicated process. And um, it's to do with tourism, it's to do with, with space um, fun, but I think it, it does go on to exploring new possibilities of how we get into space and how we do launch things rather than just using a lot of fuel um, into the outer atmosphere. So I'll just show you this movie. I think we can turn the volume up a bit on this one. Simple as that. <laughs> you do experience weightlessness as it detaches from the balloon and you go into free fall. Um, and then it slows down as it meets more and more gravity. So that's the exciting bit. But the, the thing is that you would be able to stay up in, in, in a space for a few hours rather than a quick blast in a rocket. Um, but this is something that, that um, is under development. And uh, this is something that we, we try and push with the client to, uh, to help them make this a reality. So that's, 
So I'll finish off there. i just finish off by saying that to all the people that entered the uh, RSA Design Awards and, and, and the successful as, as well as the people that, that will do better next time and, and uh, <laughs> win next time, I, I do think it's, it's a fantastic experience and a fantastic exercise in, in, in trying to hone your eyes to ears down and express it and, and explain them in a very simple way. And it's a really, really good skill to develop through the rest of your life and uh, essential, as you can see, because we're still doing it. Thank you very much. you want. Um, so um, thank you Paul for that. Um, I think that last slide in particular, or last movie in, in fact, just um, demonstrates a lot of what we think about here, which is that design is a lot about um, optimism and thinking that things can change and believing in the impossible is possible. So um, we have time for questions now, but before we begin, I unsurprisingly have a question for you, Paul. Um, thinking about the advice that you gave to the mm -hmm. next generation of designers in the room, which is around design education, really, and what do you yeah. think with the move towards service design and lots of design disciplines coming together, mm -hmm. how, what kinds of designers are you looking for in your studio and what, how do you think we should be training our designers today? Um, well, I, I definitely the disciplines in design are, are, are falling apart and coming together. Um, you know, we're designing buildings when, you know, my background's product design. Um, so I think it's all, it's all coming, uh, coming together. Um, what we look for are people that are brilliantly talented. Um, and uh, I still, I mean, my, maybe it's me, but I, I still like looking at people's sketchbooks. I still, I still like to try and get inside people's minds to see, see what, whether they, they actually, what's going on. Um, obviously, lots of graphics and, and um, fi highly finished visuals um, are very difficult to see past in some cases and what's actually going on. So um, I think uh, looking for, for really great thinking. Um, I do think that, that a lot of the computer skills can be learned. Uh, they're becoming easier. Um, and the sort of programs that we use you know, are not affordable by, by colleges in many cases. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've, we've taken a different route because it, instead of um, trying to have designers working with operators, as, as, as many of the car companies operate in, um, we, we train our designers to use the program. Uh, so that, for instance, those that in, in, you know, would know uh, products like um, Alias, uh, we train the designers to work in Alias and they actually work in it rather than getting someone then to render it up. And, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a slightly different skill to, to the required um, normal education. But I, I believe, you know, with the right mind, that, that, that's easily achievable. Easily achievable. There you go. <laughs> um, great. Um, I think we have time for some questions now. If you'd like to ask a question, could you please raise your hand and wait for the roving microphone to come to you? Oh, you see one. Yes, I see one over there. If you could just wait for the roving microphone. And yes, please. Thank you. Thanks. Uh Paul, great presentation. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. Uh, I'm Brian Kilkelly at World Cities Network. And I was just interested in, the, in the, um, talking about China and about, you know, we all marvel at how fast they do things. Mm -hmm. But actually, may that be a terrible thing, that they're moving very fast in, as you say, you know, kind of almost like copying our models, which are actually broken, mm. at great speed. So, you know, they're going to be building these high-speed rail networks, whereas actually, if, uh, if they paused and then rethought it in the way you suggested, yeah. uh, that would be much better for us. So, you know, I guess the, the question really is, uh, you know, is this a, a tragedy un, un, unravelling uh, and what can we do to stop it? Um, no, I don't think it is at all. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I do love working in China and being in China. Um, it's very interesting when, you, when you're in China, and I'm sure many people travel there, you, you do get a very different perspective on the world. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I, they are using the latest technology. Um, and they are leapfrogging many of the mistakes we made, I would like to think. Um, you know, the, the cars they're building are a lot more efficient than the ones that we perhaps were building uh, a while ago. So I, I, I think that goes for most, well, I'd like to think for most developing countries. Although, you know, I think you have to be an optimist to be a designer. So I, I think it's, you know, I, from what I see, no, it doesn't worry me. But, but the, the thing that, that, that is, is the issue is, is pollution. Um, and how, how that is, is tackled, um, uh, how, how the planet will survive that. Uh, something that, that um, obviously I'm quite thoughtful about. Um, 
and yes, when you travel, I mean, it's not, not, you could be Mexico, it could be South America, it could be um, um, uh, Istanbul, um, uh, there is an issue. And I do think design is, is the way forward to try and get people out of, you know, drive, driving cars into some other means of transport, into vehicles that communicate to each other, but it has to be mass transit. I don't think the, um, the driverless car in its current form is going to solve the problem. Uh, I think we'll end up with traffic jams full of people with no one in them. I mean, it's going to be <laughs> empty traffic jams. But I think once, once the technology starts to bring it together and, and they start communicating and people start um, thinking about different ways of getting from A to B, then it's going to really make a big difference. Great. Um, there's a question at the back there. Yes. Hello. Uh, Matt Hunter from the Design Council. Hello. Paul, I'm uh, in intrigued that you're designing a building. Could you say a bit more about perhaps why you think you've been asked to design a building and what you're going to bring that classic building designers, architects, might not bring? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we're designing hotels. We're doing a hotel in Macau at the moment. Um, I'm going to annoy some architects now. Um, but, I mean, it's in, I, I just think if you, get, if, you, if you stay in a hotel, um, I think you think about, well, you know that, number one, the room, the comfort of the bed's the most important thing, the, the size of the bathroom. Um, in some respects, the outside of the building isn't your number one priority. Um, so uh, the way we tackle it is working from inside out, um, thinking about how we can improve uh, uh, you know, small spaces and make them work very, very effectively. Because of the work we do on a in a aircraft, um, every square millimetre is a premium. So we, we, we have become quite specialised in making luxury small spaces, um, as on cruise ships or, or um, in hotels. So I think it's a slightly different approach. Um, I think it's a practicality that perhaps we would bring... Um, to interior design. Um, I don't like decoration. I don't like sort of that sort of uh, that styling aspect of design. Um, I get interested in, when we were designing um, the new Motel 6 hotels in America, um, we found that, that circular mirrors are quicker to clean than square ones um, because you can clean them like that. <laughs> and by doing that, then, then you can clean more rooms in a day and, and um, the company can make more money and um, the people that are more efficient. And I, and I love those sorts of things. And to, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's going to be sort of some sort of really um, boring space. It's a fun space, but it's practical. Um, and it really does annoy me if I'm staying in a hotel and I can't read in bed or I can't shave because there's enough light. I mean, that is bad design. Um, and you'd never get away with that on a train or an aeroplane. Because, you know, if, if, if your light doesn't work and you're on an aeroplane, you think the wings are going to fall off. Or, you know, it, it's, it's like, like there's, there's something really worried, you know, it, it has to work. Or, or perhaps, you know, it can't take off because something's broken. So it's, you know, it's a really, really stringent area of design. So I think we bring all of these learnings from other disciplines and bring it into a building trade, which is still mixing buckets of mud, as far as I can work out, so, to make buildings, when it should be something which is much more... Uh, sort of high tech and, and more to do with some of the other industries around. Great. Are there any other questions? I see one, uh, one at the back there, and then we'll take one at the front here. Thank you. Hello, my name's Julie Fleck. I was really interested in your um, design for the um, wheelchair accessible yeah. seat in the aeroplane, and, and I'm wondering how we can shift. Um, students to think around inclusive design rather than waiting to be told to design something for a disabled person yeah. and I wondered what thoughts you had around that issue yeah it's it's a it's a it's a difficult one I mean we'll all be in a wheelchair at some point in our lives um, but I think you only start to think about it when you get a bit older maybe I don't um, I, I, it is it is a difficult one I, I, I do think that that um, just, just the way that, that, that certain aspects of, of, of this area is communicated um, and, and the, the, the way that things do work seamlessly um, are, is important. Um, I mean, we're, we're always challenging trying... Because most projects, when we're designing a train or, or, or something like this or a bus or whatever, um, you're given a regulation. And, and I think most people's reaction is, well, do we have to meet that? Can't we get around it in some way? But I, I think the, the challenge is to go one step further and try and make it better and integrate it so it's just normal. Um, and I think, I, I would like to think that, that that's the way it has to go. Um, and uh, it is possible through careful design that it's, it, you don't notice it. Um, and then sometimes the, the, the areas which are designed for, for, for 
particular person's use is, is the most desirable place to sit rather than a, a normal seat. So I, I do think you can turn it on its head a bit. Um, but maybe um, it's a question we can discuss later with everybody and, and see what we can, how we can get this, this more into, into the sort of the forefront of some of these, uh, these industries. Yeah. Excellent. And the question here at the front. Hello, and thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, this is a question that's kind of directed towards both of you. What was your experience of judging the Student Design Awards? What, what, kind of, what, were you, what really caught your eye and what did you look for? Um, well, fantastic standard of work. Um, I always, I always love judging uh, design competitions. Um, I, I, I just think it's really interesting because there's always something very surprising. And I, I love that sort of, God, I haven't thought of it in that way. Um, and that's what I'm always looking for. It's, uh, just, just sort of really nice thinking, pure nice thinking. And uh, it, it, I mean, this, this year was fantastic. Uh, all the entries were absolutely brilliant. I'm not, I'm not on the panel, but as everyone knows, I sit, sit in on every panel. Um, I think it's amazing, so there you go. <laughs> um, I think it's the best program out there. But um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so it's oh. the last minute. I, do, I do think the challenge, though, is, is, is to get an idea across in like a split second, um, because it's that one, I get it. And that's the challenge. I mean, particularly when you're designing, you know, designing products for internet sale or um, you know, we, we, we design lots of video recording, well, video sort of CD players and things like that, 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 that appears on the screen on the internet. And do you like it? No. You know, is, is it that quickly or do I like it? Yes, I'll buy it. And it's really interesting that that, that is affecting how design is, is actually being steered in certain areas um, because it's that quick response. And it's the same as, you know, the, the awards. Actually, I think on that point, it's worth saying that um, it's probably, you know, the, the judging sessions themselves are relatively closed, but for lots of the students here, what you probably don't know is just how much your work actually provokes discussion amongst the judges. So there are long and sometimes heated debates about the work there um, and really about the way that students have thought about these issues and, as Paul said, the surprising nature of sometimes the way that someone has thought of something in a way that none of the people on our juries had ever expected to see. And, and that's something that is a real um, joy for everyone who sits on the panels um, to see. And, and that's why we ask them to commit long days to the process. Um, and, and Paul can attest to having chaired, chaired the jury that it's, um, it's, not, it's about the student work, but it's actually about where design is going. And, and to see these student ideas coming to the fore is amazing. I think there's one last question over here. Um, if you just wait for the roving microphone. Uh, it's not the lectern, there's a person behind the lectern. <laughs> Hi. Um, I work with a lot of uh, young creatives and design students, and a lot of the feedback we get is that they're not being brave enough in their work. Mm -hmm. um, can see that, obviously, you do some really brave things like sending parachutes up into space. What advice would you give to um, young creatives to be more brave? I mean, um, I think just have a, a... Well, have yeah, if you've got an idea, just try it, I would say. Um, I think one of the problems that a lot of people have is, is that, that if they have an idea and that they're, they're sort of a bit worried about showing it to people, or they're a bit, they, they think, well, I better not show it to anyone that's not going to like it. When I think that the thing you have to do is show it to the worst person you can think of. Um, <laughs> and if they like it, then you're onto a good thing. But um, you know, you just show it to the person that's going to be the most critical and then try and respond to it. And, and if, it, if there's something there, then still keep pushing it. Um, so don't be too precious, um, you know, show it to lots of people, teamwork, um, which is something that we, we do all the time. Um, and don't be, don't be worried about criticism, really, I think. I, th I think that's the... <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, we do have one more question, and then we'll wrap it up after that. The woman at the back, please. Um, thanks for the talk. I, I work for the Great Recovery Project, um, which I know that you've heard of um, and written about recently, I believe. Um, you touched just in your talk on the conflict between efficiency and longevity, mm -hmm. or the potential conflict um, in terms of design. Could you say a little bit more about that in terms of the, the kind of battle between paring down, becoming more efficient, yeah. and arguably more disposable? and kind of designing up, in a way, yeah. becoming uh, made for longer life yeah. uh, and more modular. I mean, I suppose w when you're working in, in sort of public, in the public arena, 
then, then it is a slightly different, I mean, it's almost like the consumer and the consumer market and the, and, the, and the more sort of public transport where you do need to design something that will last an awful long time. Um, I, th I think there are some ways of making things which will make them last an awful lot of a long time. Uh, and there are some materials that get better with age rather than worse, like shoes or you know, things that, that I, I, you know, look better. I think lived-in furniture looks better than new furniture. And I think that's, that's the really interesting area. Um, I think the, the other area to think about is, is, is the whole process of manufacture, the cost of manufacture, the, the implication of manufacture, not just the object, and then how it's going to be used in its end of its life. Um, it's, a, it's a very complicated area. Um, and I, I think in many cases, when we're working in, in the more sort of product area, it, it, sadly, it's often down to the designer to actually lead that discussion and prove that if we use this material, which is better, it, is it going to be more expensive? In which case, how do you justify that cost? Um, interesting, we were designing a, a, a hotel, um, for a, a series of hotels for a, a company, and um, they, they were producing like 50,000 rooms. And what they were concerned about is that in, in, a years, in years to come, there would be a sort of, someone would snap a picture of all of the bathrooms on a scrap heap somewhere. And they were worried about that from a PR point of view. And that was driving why they need to do something better. And I thought that was quite bizarre, but at least they got there in the end. But, but <laughs> right result, but how they got there. And it's really interesting. So I think there are lots of ways of, of that is actually beginning to happen. Great. Um, please join me in thanking Paul for his presentation. And <laughs> well, I've got a, a, a question for you, Paul. Well, yes. more of an observation, I guess, but those wonderful Chinese trains yeah. with it beautifully streamlined still had a really old-fashioned windscreen wiper blade. I wonder whether there's a high-tech solution to yeah. keeping that windscreen clean and dry. I'll leave you with that challenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, the RSA Student Design Awards uh, are the uh, paramount competition for students looking to apply design thinking and skills to social issues. And I am honored and delighted to, uh, to be invited to announce the 2015 RSA Student Design Award winners this evening. Um, I've judged the, uh, the, the, the student awards many times over the years, so I know how difficult uh, a challenge it is to be selected. Anyway, um, the winners we're announcing tonight were selected after a rigorous two-stage judging process where all the work is viewed by a panel of judges in a very long day, usually, I can report. And a list of finalists is created, and then the, those finalists are then interviewed uh, about their research and their design process. Uh, so the winners are then chosen after extensive jury deliberation. So they really have been put through their paces. Um, before I announce the winners, I'd like to uh, tell you all about the actual awards uh, that we're handing out to the students. Um, uh, they are designed by Robin Levine, uh, Royal Design for Industry, and a longtime friend and supporter of the RSA. Uh, the awards were inaugurated last year to celebrate, as uh, Severa said, the, uh, the 90th anniversary of the RSA Student Design Awards program. Uh, Robin designed the award to, to commemorate the moment our winners take that big step and start their careers as designers for social change, and they are true stepping stones. Uh, so thank you, Robin. I'm not sure Rob, whether Robin's here this evening. Thank you, Robin, for designing these beautiful awards. Uh, I know the winners will cherish them for years to come. So, on to the presentations. Uh, I'll just say, when your name is called, if it is called, uh, could I kindly ask the winners to come up on the stage and collect your award from Paul. So, for the brief creative conditions sponsored by RBS, uh, which asks students to design and develop a vision for an environment or situation that prompts and fosters creative thinking, uh, there are two winning teams. The first is Ellie Lanham and Tristan Thompson from the University of the West of England. <laughs> for their project SPART, a workshop program 
a, for a workshop program for primary school pupils to invent a new sport, improving their creative thinking skills and ability to innovate. The judges were impressed by Ellie and Tristan's enthusiasm for the project and the fact that they had prototyped the workshop in a local primary school, uh, using this feedback then to refine and improve their project. Thank you. The second team is uh, Raika Suomenin, sorry, Suominen, Thea Engerdahl and Wilde Björgen from Kingston University in London for Connect, Create and Collaborate. The project was a proposal for a new mobile creativity network on the London Underground that gives people creative prompts to draw out those who don't consider themselves to be naturally creative. The judges commented on the team's thorough research and understanding of the barriers to creativity and how they developed a solution that tackled these in a way that would help a large number of people at one time. In addition, uh, students responding to the Creative Conditions Brief were asked to submit a business case for their project, and there was a separate judging session for these. And the two winners of the best business cases are Magdalena Boazeka from the University of Dundee for the business case she developed for her project. Pl plug in. Plugin is a mobile 3D printer lab to support people and communities who lack access to adequate equipment to help them develop their creative capacities. Magdalena was shortlisted for both the best design project and the best business case, which she won. She wowed the judges with her business acumen and the fact that she had an answer for every question the judges asked her, <laughs> uh, from the market competitors to the potential risks of her proposal. And next up is Helen Carwatt, also from the University of Dundee, for the business case she developed for her project, Pulse. <laughs> Pulse is a portable, not-for-profit based music practice, performance and recording space that allows people to make music. Helen demonstrated a unique understanding of the ins and outs of how she could create a business from her concept and impressed the jury with her professionalism and passion for design and social change. Next we have the, the brief Moving Pictures, supported by Patricia Tyndale Legacy to the RSA, which asks students to conceive and produce an animation to accompany an audio file from the RSA event series that will clarify, energize and illuminate the content. There are four winners here, and the first is Zayul Hack from the University of Huddersfield for his animation titled Design is More Than Meets the Eye to accompany... <laughs> ...an animation to accompany an excerpt from a lecture by the design critic Alice Rawsthorne. Zayul used his, imagination, uh, sorry, used his animation to highlight issues around child labor and the power of design to positively change the world. The judges were impressed with his use of clean lines and strong colors to make a statement. Also, we have Dan Palmer, whose film we saw earlier, I think, from Canterbury Christchurch University for his in, uh, animation titled Kinetic Typography to accompany an excerpt from a lecture by the author Ian Leslie on Curiosity. The judges commented on Dan's clever use of typography and moving image to bring the content to life and felt that his animation was of professional quality. Next we have Georgina Venning from Arts University Bournemouth for her animation Exploration and Discovery also to accompany the Curiosity excerpt. The animation was Georgina's first foray into the world of animation and filmmaking, and she chose to create a stop-motion film that impressed the judges with its charm and humor. And last in this category, but not least, of course, is Libby Parfit and Dom Oka from the University of the West of England for their animation, Curious Owls, also to accompany Ian Leslie on Curiosity.
Libby and Dom told the story of curiosity through evocative illustrations of a family of owls and some of their curious habits. <laughs> I'm intrigued now. <laughs> Moving on. For the brief Water for All, sponsored by Unilever, looking to enlighten the burden of water collection for women in the developing world, uh, the first winner is Christopher Rotherer from the University of Nottingham for Sustainable Filtration Kit. This is a water purification kit that produces high quality carbon from scrap wood, which is then used to filter contaminated water. Christopher's mindful and clever solution demonstrated cultural sensitivity and humanitarian understanding of the brief. The panel was especially impressed by his extensive user testing and iterating and applauded the excellent level of detail in his response. Next we have Karina Jensen and Selim Ozadar, uh, of Alto University in Finland for Guardians of Water. <laughs> Karina and Selim are unable to join us tonight, but we congratulate them on their win and we'll post them their awards. The project was a service design solution that uses live open data on available water sources to enhance local knowledge around uh, water management. Karina and Selim's humanistic, empowering, and sustainable approach uniquely incorporated use of open data into the service solution. For the brief, The Daily Diet, sponsored by Waitrose and co-developed with Shift, which asks students to design a way of, to make healthy eating appealing to young people, the first winner is Cairo Hamilton of Nottingham Trent University for, for dinner. For Dinner is an app that supports a move towards healthier eating, uh, eating, providing prompts, recipes, suggestions, and advice through a 21-day challenge period. The judges were impressed with Cairo's understanding of behavioral economics to form a healthy eating habit and the way he designed it, his app to appeal to potential users. Also winning in this category is uh, April Bale and Holly Erdley from London's Kingston University for their project, Tuck took stop. <laughs> took stop is a traveling snack shop offering school children an, an alternative healthy snack on their journey between home and school. April and Holly impressed the judges with how they worked together as a team to come up with a brand and service design proposal that understood the key touch points in the decision-making process for young people on what to eat. For the brief Human by Nature, sponsored by the Eden Project and supported by the Wellcome Trust, uh, uh, asking students to design a means of encouraging people to take care of their own human microbiome, that's the community of bacterial microbes that live inside us, we all knew. Uh, the uh, first winner is Katie Green of Northumbria University for Baby Biome. <laughs> baby Biome is a special swaddling blanket for babies born by cesarean to help them acquire the microbes they will need for a healthy start in life. The product is accompanied by a campaign designed to help people better understand how to nurture a healthy human microbiome from birth. Katie's thorough research into the issue was unanimously applauded by the judges, and they were impressed that she was bold enough to take on a sensitive issue. <laughs> also winning is uh, uh, James Washington from Buckinghamshire New University for Inner Garden. Inner Garden is an all-encompassing health brand that helps people reshape the body's internal flora back to a more natural and healthy state. James impressed the jury with the fact that he had thought holistically about his proposal and really understood what makes an attractive consumer brand that could also be beneficial to people's human microbiomes. 
Moving on, for the brief Fair Play, sponsored by Springitz and NatraCare, uh, which asked students to design or redesign a consumer toy and its product packaging to minimize waste and environmental impact. First winner is Lisa Hornsey of Northumbria University for Squiggle. Squiggle is an ecologically produced and gender neutral playhouse made of chalkboard that allows children to bring their imagination to life and transform the toy by drawing on it. The judging panel was extremely impressed by Lisa's excellent insights and systems thinking and on her strong visual and verbal presentation. They applauded the gender neutrality of Squiggle, which they praised for being instantly marketable, but also completely magical. And I should say that Lisa also won the RSA Student Design Awards last year, joining Paul, uh, <laughs> Paul Priestman there. And so we congratulate her on her being a two-time winner. Congratulations. Second winner in this category is Christopher Doyle from University of Northampton for Morty, a multifunctional educational toy product. Morty's circular design incorporates packaging and upcycling of household waste as part of the play experience, encouraging a regenerative cycle of play that minimizes waste. The judges commented in particular on Christopher's broad design approach to problem solving and on his ingenuity and passion for craftsmanship. In addition, they applauded the direction he pursued with Morty, which explored multifunctionality and toy use over time. For the brief Mobility City, sponsored by Priestman Good, to design or redesign a mode of public transport to improve the experience of people with disabilities that will, in turn, improve the experience for all, uh, the first winner is Rebecca Grover of Kingston University in London for London Accessible. London Accessible is a service that provides live transport accessibility information, enabling users to plan their journeys on the go. London Accessible stood out because it is both an independent app and a plug-in for existing journey planners such as CityMapper, and the proposal allows people with mobility issues to make spontaneous travel plans with ease. The judges were captivated by Rebecca's excellent research and brilliant communication skills, and her project has already been featured in mainstream national and international press. Also winning in this category, uh, Tom Cross of Falmouth University for Guidelines. <laughs> guidelines is a wayfinding system for London Underground interchanges where colour-coded guidelines on the floors and escalators indicate which platform they lead to. The system streamlines all pedestrian traffic whilst being optimised for long cane users via sensors. Tom impressed with his strong and simple idea that had benefits for the visually impaired, but also for tourists and those new to the city. The next category is for the brief uh, Heritage by Design, uh, is sponsored by Green Room Retail and the Patricia Tyndale Legacy to the RSA. It asks students to design a way for people and communities to better connect to and celebrate heritage. And the first winner is Kazuko Morohashi of Norwich University of the Arts for Walkies. Exclamation mark. <laughs> Walkies is, is an inadvertent excuse me, is an innovative digital heritage mapping and storytelling project made for children by children. Walkies empowers children to think, articulate, and define their own notion of heritage. The jury praised Kazuko's in-depth, user-centered approach to the brief and described her solution as magical, inspirational, and powerful, opening up a portal for children to explore heritage in a whole new way. In addition, the judges also praised the way Kazuko positioned walkies and thought commercially about how it could be implemented and scaled. And sadly, our last award of the night 
is uh, to, goes to Jenny Johnson and Eric Winterburn of the University of West of England for Ibagum. <laughs> Ibagum is a guide and phrase book designed as a means of, uh, for recording and preserving the Yorkshire dialect. And obviously, as a Mancunian, I'm, uh, I'm obviously very uh, uh, interested in this project. Uh, Jenny and Eric's insightful response to the brief combined strong research, intellectual interrogation, and brilliant execution. The judges also commented on the thoughtfulness of their approach, focusing on language as a heritage issue and exploring its potential to preserve and expand cultures whilst also applauding the advocacy aspect of their work. So, in, uh, in conclusion, I just want to say congratulations to all of the 2015 winners and uh, thank you to all of the sponsors and supporters of the RSA Student Design Awards. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, for me to present uh, uh, these awards this evening, or rather to assist Paul presenting the awards. Uh, you've only seen a small snapshot of the winning work here tonight, uh, but you can view more images and see, read longer descriptions of all of the winning projects on the showcase section of the RSA Student Design Awards website, which should have a, a URL, and I'm sorry, I don't know the URL, but you can find it. Uh, so I'm now going to hang back to Severa, who maybe has the URL, uh, for some closing remarks, so thank you very much. So that's sda.thersa.org if you want to find that and click on showcase. Um, so that is really it. I want to thank uh, Malcolm and Paul uh, for their contributions this evening and I'd like to congratulate the winners. Again, uh, to conclude this evening's festivities, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of the people who make the RSA Student Design Awards possible. That is the sponsors, our supporters, collaborators, jury members, course leaders, tutors who embed the, the briefs in their curriculum, and of course the students who make it all possible. Um, so all of these people are champions of the scheme and have made it such a success this year, but also in the past 91 years. I want to thank, uh, extend a personal thanks to my colleague Rebecca Ford, who's over here. She's been lurk lurking in the shadows tonight, um, but you've seen her, and it wouldn't be without her um, contributions that we'd be here tonight as well. So just to conclude, I want to say congratulations again. Um, thanks to the students for all of their hard work and for being the champions of design for social change. And without your hard work, we simply wouldn't be where we are today, nor would the world of design. Um, that's all for tonight. So please join us downstairs for the real celebration now. Um, and drinks and lots of snacks in the Benjamin Franklin room. Thanks for joining us tonight, everyone. <laughs>